I'm worried that that's going to make an echo. You should be good now. We're good now? Yeah. Okay. Um, holy cow. Well, rather than uh, repeat all that, let's just we'll look at the agenda. We're going to take care of some housekeeping. Um, scheduling our next meeting is going to be the first thing we look at. Uh, there's some legislative topics to, to address uh, that could have some play in this, uh, this effort. We're not sure. And then uh, we'll open it up for any other items that we need to take care of during housekeeping. And then uh, we'll jump into uh, kind of revisiting our value storage loss discussion that we kind of started last time. Um, that will cover just the basics of what, you know, value storage is and how it's lost and, you know, ways that it can be impacted. And then take a look at some of the research that we did. We provided that spreadsheet out uh, to the team uh, to take a look at how other cities in the Metroplex, as well as the other, you know, the, the other two or three largest cities in the state, are dealing with value storage within their jurisdictions. And then ideally today we'll have an outcome of some recommendations that we can uh, refine for adoption. So we'll, we'd like to finish this meeting with a, a relatively uh, concise list of potential things we can do for. Uh, forwarding to council to say this is how we want to start dealing with value storage in the city um, beyond the ways that we already do through the corridor development certificate process. And then uh, lastly, we'll take a look at uh, next meeting schedules and topics that we want to jump into for the next meeting. And with that, <clears throat> uh, on the topic of next meetings, I guess on the Doodle side, I've, I know some folks have had some issues with Doodle going to spam folders and things like that. Um, I don't know a better way to do that other than just emailing everybody directly, and I'm glad to do that. But uh, do y'all have a, is it working well enough, or do I just need to find some other way to reach out? I think the, the Doodle seems to work okay, but there are sometimes there's several folks that have had some issues with uh, spam being, you know, picking up the, the Doodle poll and, and no one sees it until the last minute. Uh, any reason to not keep going on with Doodle, or anybody have a preference on how to handle that? I'd say keep doing Doodle and uh, maybe send an email also that says okay. look for Doodle and check your spam. That, that seems to be the easiest thing, and I've kind of defaulted to that anyway, so we'll just continue. I'll follow up with a separate email and include the, the, the Doodle poll link so that it doesn't appear to be coming from Doodle when it comes out. Um, and then Tuesdays, again, we've been trying to avoid, <coughs> I'm trying to avoid. I've been working around my calendar on Tuesdays are the days where I have the most flexibility on count on meetings that I can ditch to attend this. And it seems like there's a lot of other folks that kind of have some flexibility on Tuesdays, but others don't. And so uh, I'd like to make sure that everybody gets as much of a chance to participate as possible. So um, unless there's somebody, unless we've got like a great day that everybody can work on, um, I'll just send out a kind of a larger doodle poll and try to get a feel for what schedules during the week look like. And also driving scheduling wise is my meeting schedules are going to change here pretty quickly. because I'm going to be doing a whole different job here at the city, no longer as the floodplain administrator, but as uh, the kind of project manager for the Panther Island things. And so a whole different department still tied in with, with floodplain things and, and likely still tied in with this this meeting, but my schedule is going to be different, and so I don't want my schedule to be what drives this. I want to make sure it works for all of y'all more than anything else. So um, I'll be putting that information into the Doodle poll as well to try to make sure that gets out to everybody. Um, and do we have a preference on morning versus afternoon? I think we've been shooting for the afternoon in the past. Um, I don't know if anybody likes to wrap up a Friday with a meeting like this, but <laughs> that's, uh, that could be an option. Um, but this time isn't bad either, because hopefully we're done in time to get out and go to lunch and have the rest of the day to take care of something. So are there preferences on lunchtime? Mine are all just subject to whatever I got going on that day. Okay. So we'll just let the doodle, we'll let the doodle pull drive the uh, the meeting schedule, and we'll see how that works out. Did you want to do it every, like every week? Is that the intent of those dates? Or? No. Those, those, are, those are dates of evening council. And so the council meeting will be at like six o'clock in the evening okay. and not affecting what's going on downtown. And again, these are like Tuesdays and Fridays. So that's kind of a remnant from when I put this together last time. We don't have to stick with Tuesdays and Fridays. And I'll, I'll have an example of what, the, what that's been looking like. 
I'll I'll send something out that's got kind of a more updated list on, to include these uh, these dates as well. So as long as that sounds like that is something that works for y'all, then we'll we'll just kind of let Google drive that. And this is just kind of an example of the timing that we're looking at. I'd, I'd like to do monthly meetings. We didn't get a meeting last month because everything was blowing up. And um, I'd like to kind of get back on track of having monthly so we can get this kind of wrapped up before the end of the fiscal year. Um, and again, this, the goal will be uh, to have you know, the city staff working on coordinating on this. We've got some, some, some information and coordination with city council to make them aware that this is happening. Also to work with council members. And we've got two new council districts that have come on since we started this process. So there's got a lot, there's a lot of catching up to do to get people up to speed on where we're at. Um, and just make sure that, you know, the different commissions, you know, like the commission, uh, board of adjustments, and the mobility and infrastructure and transportation committee, they all are up to speed on what we're doing. Because this, this kind of thing has kind of implications that could affect other design standards and requirements across the city. So we want to make sure everybody is on the same page that way. So take home for me is I'll send out a new doodle with uh, multiple days to choose from, and we'll just kind of see which ones work out best. And then uh, we'll let this, this meeting kind of drive the schedule for things that I'm going to be doing. And if I'm not able to attend, then Ben will be able to lead it. Um, and we'll just we'll tag team of it that way. And we've got a new engineer in floodplain too, uh, Juliana Barons. Um, glad to have her on board to help out with Ben and Lisa and just more hands on deck to really keep things moving. On the legislative topics, uh, the big one was House Bill 2127, the Texas Regulatory Consistency Act. It was passed. Um, it will become law in September. Uh, it was written to prevent cities and counties from enacting laws that are inconsistent with state law. So there's a, there's an interest up at the state level to try to make sure that whatever is happening at the local and regional level is consistent with state law and the Constitution. Um, we don't know how that's going to apply to Fort Worth, and we don't know how it's going to apply to this effort. So um, Roy said I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but as our <laughs> resident legal expert, yeah. Very confusing, uh, but at the end of the day, from a stormwater perspective, I, I need to dig into a little more because I don't think we're going to be as effective on the stormwater side. Yeah, it's really just what it says is that if there's any state law that there's a certain state statutes, and if any of and if the cities have any regulations that conflict with within those particular statutes, National Resources Code is one of them. That's the one I'm looking at. Um, many others, but if there's any conflicts, it's not even that. It, it, the way that it's written makes it very confusing because it essentially says that if, if it even mentions it, then it's preempted. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we can kind of go into that more, and I'll talk to you Claire more about it later if I do find anything from a stormwater perspective. But as of right now, I don't know if that particular one is Okay. Texas water can protect that. That's where. Yeah, that's where I think it would come into play. I need to look. I don't think. I, based on my reflection, I don't think the water is very well protected. I see Don Allen's got his hand raised there. You want to unmute yourself, Don? Yes, I, I believe so. Um, yeah, I, I think the the preemption bill, the, the kind of the the other kind of broader. The, what its intent is, is to say that if the state constitution and the state local government code, whether for cities or for counties, if it doesn't grant the city the right to govern something, then the cities don't have the power to grant it. But it, those are in broad categories, and my understanding is, is as he said, you know, things like drainage regulations or water and sewer regulations or things like that are clearly granted powers to the city. So I don't, I would suspect that that preemption bill wouldn't have any major impact on what we're doing here. Yeah, I, I hope that's the case. I know that we uh, have dealt with some unusual impact from state law changes in the past, like 3167 kind of being the mm -hmm. poster child for that. 
but uh, we want to at least keep our eyes on what's potentially going on so that it, uh, we don't want to don't want to go down a road that's not going to work for us. So uh, we want to make sure that we're dealing with this problem as much as we can, and then uh, just be you know legal and consistent about how we're doing it. Uh, let's see. Do you still have any any other questions there, Don? Uh, no, thank you. There was a question about does this affect higher standards or stormwater above minimum state standards, I guess. Or like uh, say detention, for example, or water quality. Do we have any idea? This particular bill, yeah. I don't. I don't think this particular bill is going to affect how we're operating um, in regards to the standards that we have. I mean, obviously we are abiding by the current statutes in the water code. My understanding is that this particular bill um, is really it's the big ones are agricultural code, finance code, insurance code, labor code, natural resources code, or occupations code. Uh, I don't think. Okay, so we'll, I guess we'll just keep an eye on that one and then Royce, I'll follow up with you to see if anything comes out of that once we start understanding more specifics on how that one's applied. Um, there were a couple of other bills that we had been keeping an eye on, um, 2789, uh, relating to the regulation of accessory dwelling units by political subdivisions that was not passed. Um, really, none of the rest of the ones that we were watching were passed. Um, they all had some sort of content that looked like it could easily be applied to stormwater or impervious cover regulation or other aspects of kind of the way we do business. And since they didn't pass, I don't think we need to worry about them too much. Um, but there were, there were some unusual things that were floating around out there that were kind of difficult to keep up with. So um, that's really the, the main point of, of this aspect of it, the legislative topics. Um, did the, did the third party review pass? The third party reviews? I'm not aware. Okay, I forget which number that is, but Don may know more about that than I do as far as if it passed or not. But if the city's not reviewing and approving plans or studies, the consultant, the developer can go out and get a third party, qualified third party, mm -hmm. to review. Move it forward. That includes inspections as well. You don't know the bill number on that one at all. I'll look it up for you. Yeah. Okay. I think it's been considered. Yeah. yeah. And how that affects you is we turn in a complex flood study to you guys, and it takes six months to review. They can go hire a third party reviewer to get it approved and move it forward. So that would be interesting. That would be it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, that I think you're talking about HB 14, Travis. Okay. And that that did pass, and was signed. Okay. Well, we'll make a note of that one as well, just to see how that could work out. Um, is that tied to the shot clock? Is there not really something in the shot clock in the middle? No, it is it, it 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 it's not tied to the shot clock per se. And as a matter of fact, on thirty one sixty seven, they actually passed some legislation to kind of ease some language in it that actually TML. I think the the Build Association worked together to kind of clean it up a little bit and maybe take plans out of the same review or the the the, the timeline cycle, so it's plats, not plans now. What what do you reference? That was 31. Uh, but I don't, I, that was a, a revision to it. And I think it also helps that. Right. The it's, it's authority to review yeah. and approve yeah. versus going to having on a plan commission to get your plan. Right. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, those, those, those are HBs 3697 and 3699. Okay. Yeah, the VA, the Home Building Association tried to work with the city of Fort Worth specifically and DJ to rewrite some of that language to make it 
easier in the city of Fort Worth to do what we need to get done mm -hmm. to approve things timely. Right. We're just having to go to plan commission every time you have to get a set of plans approved. Yeah. That seems like a, a lot of extra work. Okay. Any other questions on legislative topic before we move on? Okay. So uh, I guess we'll get into a, kind of a brief recap of our Valley Storage discussion that we had and started last time. Uh, we got some questions, or I received some questions from stakeholders here about uh, things that were related to uh, the information we sent out and kind of a, they were a good opportunity to kind of put into, I guess, a, a tidy way to recap some of the information we looked at. Uh, and I explained how we define Valley Storage and what causes loss of Valley Storage. Um, explain or define cut and fill, and is excavation the same as cut, and then discuss how does balancing fill within excavation in the floodplain offset valley storage or loss of valley storage. So these are three questions that I kind of grouped together to, to kind of look at the, on the next slide here. Um, I guess the valley, you know, real briefly here, the valley storage is kind of what the, the volume of water that floods the floodplain. And so in a valley or a stream bank situation, when the flood comes up, it fills in the valley. And that, that, that volume of water is something you can calculate and understand uh, as a function of how that basin drains and, and performs. And so, you know, we're interested in, in that number so that uh, when you place fill in the floodplain or try to reclaim land, that forces that water to go somewhere else. And so it, it essentially changes the way the basin performs. You get a, you could end up with higher flows moving downstream faster. And uh, when we're talking about cut and fill, um, that is exactly kind of what the terms are. You'll we'll see you know plans with cuts and fills shown on them to show where water where soil can be removed from a cut and then placed in a fill area. Um, sometimes on site, move it from one location to another to reclaim a spot. Uh, and then that in itself doesn't necessarily change valley storage because the, kind of the you're moving the you balance know, the balance from one side to the other or one location to another, so the volume stays the same even though you change the look of the floodplain. And so that's I got kind of a tidy little example here that shows what that looks like. So uh, valley storage is a good thing, and because you're holding a flooded water in in a valley in a nature valley instead of building in that valley and forcing the flood water to go somewhere else where you don't want it. Right. Is that right? Right. And, and you know, all streams kind of start out in this natural situation where, you know, water's mm -hmm. flowing downstream and it collects in a low spot and mm -hmm. it, it carries sediment with you and that's what creates the valleys. Right. Um, and then the, the volume of that those valleys is kind of what floods it. Okay. When, when development okay. activity comes in and wants to reclaim some land or to uh, straighten out a stream to fit the property line. Like that. Those situations change the way the stream and the valley work. Okay. And we just want to make sure that that valley storage, when it changes, how much does it change and, and does it change in a way that causes you know, potential impact or not. Mm -hmm. So this, this exhibit here is one that I've picked up from uh, the village of Winneke, Illinois. Everybody's got an exhibit like this. Um, and I, I, every time I do a presentation like this, I go kind of go out Google and see kind of what the newest versions of these things are out there. Because there's some really good stuff out there these days. This one's pretty basic, but um, we've used something just like this before. And you can see on the left-hand side, you've got the little caterpillar moving around the dirt. He filled in some uh, land uh, below the 100-year flood elevation. And then uh, that's taking up valley storage. And on the right-hand side, you can see kind of this little hatched area where they excavated material to restore the balance of, of the valley storage in this particular situation. So this is really common. This happens in like 99% of developments. And then sometimes you know you can you can fill in without recovering. Uh, FEMA allows that right now because they don't they don't study and they don't look at valley storage impacts. In Fort Worth we do that a lot. We look at valley storage impacts because it it plays into how uh, detention is kind of created on site sometimes. So, on a number of developments that the has been involved in, they'll create storage ponds along the creek to to retain water and, and help mm -hmm. kind of force the valley storage to restore some mm -hmm. of what was might have been lost. 
so this is real common um, when NECI Illinois is dealing with it. It's just this is kind of a good example of how the cut and fill uh, looks and performs in the world. This is all done on site to a particular development. So, right, that's a good point. So once it leaves the site, it's a net zero is, is the goal. Right. right, and that's in Fort Worth. You know, we we want we look at these we call edge conditions. You know, things that happen within the development. You know, can change kind of all kinds of stuff. But the water that comes in and the water that leaves, you want to have those kind of essentially the same as mm -hmm. before the project. Mm -hmm. And everybody likes that, so you can say, well, there's not you know impacts that are affecting right. other folks. So, Clara, to say that compensatory storage is valley storage, in case somebody wonders if those words are interchangeable. Right, that's a good point. So compensatory storage, they're basically compensating for the fill that was placed on the other side of the creek. So this is all related to valley storage. Um, different people, different communities have different terms for that. That's a good point, Marissa. So they're basically just compensating for the loss of storage on, on the side that had the fill. Is this commonly done for project development and for work? Oh, yeah. That's part of the normal. Okay. Almost yeah. every project. Forgive me, Bryson. Mm -hmm. Early question. Yeah. So, <clears throat> just to clarify that, typically it is not done for the valley storage itself, mm -hmm. that volume of water. Mm -hmm. What what they're doing it for is, is the water surface elevation. Mm -hmm. So, when they place fill, it causes the water surface to go up. Right. So, typically that cut or that compensatory excavation is usually done on the same side of the creek, mm -hmm. but whatever they fill, mm -hmm. they're cutting yeah. to offset the water surface. Right. It doesn't necessarily add up to a one-to-one, -one, you know, storage volume, mm -hmm. and that's what we're talking about is looking at the volume. So if you look at Winnetka, Illinois, it says compensatory storage must equal at least 1.1 times. So what they're saying is 10% increase. They won't 10% increase. So if you take 100 cubic yards and put that in the floodplain, you've got to put 110 back in. Yeah. Cut. Right. Um, right. So, so you got you end up with more storage than you started with. Right. So kind of trying to do a good thing. So right. so this whole game is a water surface elevation game, mm -hmm. and they don't really regulate the valley storage like Claire said. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Fort Worth, this is done all the time, but it's Still, that water surface elevation game, mm -hmm. not necessarily the valley storage volume game. So, what we're talking about here, is what what we know is that that matters also, mm -hmm. and it may not actually affect this site, but it's probably somewhere downstream going to affect. And if it's a little here lost and a little there mm -hmm. over the years, it definitely affects the yeah. water surface. And that's and that's the nuts and bolts of our cumulative impacts that we're trying to right. really get our handle on. Okay. <clears throat> so on the next, I guess the next question, there, is there any engineering logic to some cities are referencing six inches or one foot, two foot above the 100 floodplain? And how they come up with those amounts and will it help? And is the 100 year flood uh, still valid in this context? And that, that's kind of what Ben was getting at there is that 100 year flood elevation is it's kind of the driver that FEMA requirements mm -hmm. have, and then most cities have adopted in some way. Um, and so this next exhibit, I think, talks a little bit about that too, and shows another good example. This is from Nevada Division of Water Resources. Um, again, you got your your yellow caterpillar up there. You got fill on both sides of the creek this time, and this is kind of the more classic FEMA development uh, paradigm. They got fill on both sides, and they're showing this floodway in the middle. And the floodway is, is kind of FEMA's way of allowing development to happen. Um, but you can see that the floodway elevation is higher than the blue line, which is the 100 year flood elevation. So FEMA acknowledges that there's potential for an increase in water surface mm -hmm. fill in the sides. Um, that's, that's something that we have to keep an eye on so that we're not causing. Uh, New developments to flood just from their own development activities, and so when when a community chooses six inches or a foot or two feet above for like the finished floor elevations, you can see the building on the right is higher than the flood elevation from the floodway, mm -hmm. and the floodway is higher than the hundred-year floodplain. Mm -hmm. They're they're building in kind of this this minimum finished floor requirement, which is higher than the FEMA flood elevation. And the FEMA minimum standards are 
you must have your lowest floor or your finished floor at or above 100 years. And there's a bunch of cities that do right at. Mm -hmm. And the floodway is going to flood every one of them. <laughs> and so that, that's, that's just a kind of ridiculous aspect of the FEMA regulations. If, if you do the FEMA minimums, you're going to have flooding down the road. Mm -hmm. And so Fort Worth has, has been mindful of that for forever. And we've always been, you know, like plus two feet. Mm -hmm. And not just two feet, but two feet over fully developed conditions because, A, we know weird things can happen, so we want to have some, some cushion. And we know the land's going to develop. We're, we're interested in this. As a city, we're interested in development. We want to have, you know, developments happen in, in the city to help, you know, build the tax base and, and all those things that go along with development. We're trying to account for that and deal with it. And the way the theme or with it, Fort Worth dealt with it in the past is we just acknowledge that there's going to be a lot more water coming. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we can't really do that like we used to anymore. So that kind of builds into this cumulative impacts discussion is, you know, we've got a whole lot of infrastructure that's downstream of everything that's new coming in. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is undersized. And so we're, we're creating a problem for ourselves by putting more water downstream. Mm -hmm. and potentially taking on some liability from other communities that our water drains into. And so we want to be mindful of that mm -hmm. as well. So that's got all kind of builds into this, but this is just another example of kind of showing how the valley storage plays into um, the development process and how, how developments can occur that we need to be looking at how to, how to manage that water in a, a different way than we have. How does a community decide six inches, one foot, two foot? Well, that's ultimately a, Political decision, okay. um, and what you think is possible, and I guess, I mean, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, it seems like more is better. You have more credit. in it's general. Better. You, you can say that, but I think there's probably some some diminishing returns. I mean, right, 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 right. What we're talking when they say the the hundred year floodplain, that's the one percent chance per year storm, mm -hmm. and you know the the, the likelihood of that mm -hmm. is the same, but the, the basins change over time, so the that same flood is different, you know, for the same 1% chance you get, you get a different storm over years, different in time. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to account for all those things, but um, in Fort Worth with the two feet uh, scenario, we're, we feel like we're being pretty safe mm -hmm. without being, you know, crazy five feet or something like that, which would be difficult to achieve. Right, right. Um, so it's but things that developers and developments can do to be safe from flooding without being so onerous that, um, you know, it's, it's like almost never going to flood. So that you don't create an unnecessary burden. Right. right. That's unachievable. Right. Okay. So that's that's kind of the goal. Do you have anything <clears throat> to add on to that, Ben? Or? No, I just, you know, two feet's better than one, three feet's better than mm -hmm. two. But at what point is it, is it, uh, if, if you're filling one house, <laughs> How much fill does that take to elevate mm -hmm. two feet? Maybe talk about what other major cities do. That'd be helpful. It's kind of the industry standard has been two feet um, for major cities, I would say. Smaller cities, I would say. Yeah, so. Yeah. And would you say that your national flood insurance program for First, your city, yeah. your your community gets a better rating right, mm -hmm. for insurance and things mm -hmm. like that? Right. So having two feet is better than one foot mm -hmm. and then. <laughs> You know, one foot's better than the FEMA minimum, mm -hmm. and, and the National Flood Insurance Program has a way to reward communities uh, for having higher standards. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of an acknowledgement that FEMA knows there's potential for a problem if you just do the minimum. Mm -hmm. But doing the minimum still saves on flood insurance costs versus doing nothing. And so the Ben kind of leads our community rating system program that uh, documents all the extra things that we do as a city of Fort Worth to get uh, to show our higher standards and, and get some credit for that from from the National Flood Insurance Program in the form of reduced flood insurance premiums for people in Fort Worth. Okay. And, and this is a above FEMA minimum. In 2021, they just changed it for us to even participate in that program. We have to do at least one foot. Mm -hmm. Every community in the in the nation okay. has to at least have one foot. <laughs> So it is good to benchmark, and like Claire did that for this valley storage, benchmark communities in the area because flooding is different mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think the highest I've seen is probably Houston right now after Hurricane Harvey, and I believe it is is it two feet above the 500 year I've seen, which is like really okay. above. The okay. Mountain. Yeah. So, but I would say one to two feet is pretty standard. Well, the chart you had was interesting, and it just it, you can note on the chart there were different levels, right? And that's why I was kind of curious about that. Right. But it says Valley Storage for ultimate. I think that's key, not FEMA effective, which a lot of cities do for Valley Storage requirements. And right. For ultimate conditions, correct? Here's right. Storage protection. Right. And then, you know, as we're going to be functionally re redefining what ultimate means as part of this process, because it's it's not going to probably not going to end up being you know fully paved and you know things that we expected in the past. It's going to be some something in between existing today and what we think ultimate might be. So that's that's going to be part of this discussion. It's it's sort of a little bit of a moving target, but we get to kind of choose the target too. And then like you said, other cities have different requirements. So mm -hmm. you know Grand Prairie will have you know one foot over ultimate or two feet over FEMA on the same stream. So that's two different Floods, basically. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's there's all kinds of ways to do it, and ultimately it's a political decision that you know we can recommend as engineers. You know, it ought to be two feet, and then the politicians could be could say, well, that's that's really problematic for the development community or something, or they might say, well, we need to go higher. We want to do mm -hmm. something more than that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of where that boils down. So. Um, another question: um, Is there any Commonality among cities with no requirements. And this is from the uh, the spreadsheet that I sent out. Um, so if if a community doesn't have a valid storage requirement, is there commonality between those? And then among the cities with the no loss accepted, or does it seem to be arbitrary? And looking back at the at the spreadsheet that I sent out, I kind of went through and tried to tabulate it in a way to try to find some commonality. And I don't. I don't know that I can find a lot of commonality. Um, we surveyed 16 communities. Uh, 13 of them were in the DFW Metroplex area. Uh, plus, we added in the three largest cities in Texas. We had San Antonio, Houston, and Austin. And then us, we're, we're comparing ourselves to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, all the three largest have valley storage regulations. Um, the three, or three of the no regulation cities still participate in the corridor development certificate program with us. So if they're on the Trinity River, then they're likely in the corridor development certificate. So they do manage valley storage on the Trinity, but not elsewhere in their city. Mm -hmm. And then five of the six remaining no regular regulation cities are not eligible to participate in the CDC. So if you're not, if you don't have Trinity floodplain in your city, then you're not going to be in CDC. Mm -hmm. The exception to that is the city of Benbrook. And they're like the tippy tippy top of the clear fork of the Trinity River, and they don't think that they have any impact on anything that's going on, given the amount of floodplain that they have there. So they, they decided not to participate in CDC. So they're the only community that, that I really know of that has Trinity floodplain in the Metroplex and doesn't participate in CDC. Claire, do you want to just quickly give a recap on what CDC? Means? That's a good point. So. CDC or the Corridor Development Certificate is a, a multi-jurisdictional program. Uh, it was kind of started by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, I'm going to break your 1980. Yeah. yeah. And so there's the, the record of decision that the Corps came out with, which was related to the, the 404 permit for developing in the Trinity floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, the CDC was put together to make that process more consistent and, and easier to apply from one community to the next, so everybody kind of had the same kind of deal. And all the cities between Dallas and Fort Worth uh, basically signed on to this to participate and manage flood storage or valley storage mm -hmm. related to developments in their in their jurisdiction. So for CDC, if you're in the 100-year floodplain, you have to you have to calculate how much valley storage exists on your property and then how much you're going to reclaim uh, mm -hmm. From that, and then you have to mitigate within the 100 year 100%. Mm -hmm. So, if you're going to bring in a thousand yards of fill material, you have to excavate out a thousand yards of, mm -hmm. of cut somewhere on your property. Mm -hmm. um, then they have a higher storm, which they call the standard project flood, which is what basically all the levee systems around here were designed for. 
And that storm, you're allowed to have up to a 5% loss of, of flood storage in there. But that's an extreme event. It's like mm -hmm. an 800-year storm mm -hmm. in Fort Worth. So it's a mm -hmm. much higher storm than the 100-year. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, all, the, all these cities participate in, in that program. And this worked really well to minimize uh, increases in mm -hmm. flooding related to development in the Trinity floodplain. Now, there's still increases in flooding because impervious cover is happening outside of the floodplain in the basin. That's not regulated. Uh, it's by CDT. You say outside the basin. Is that how you describe it? Is or outside the outside of the, the the valley storage area, or outside of the maps okay. that regulate CDT. Okay. So if it's outside the Trinity floodplain, okay. they're they're outside in the drainage basin, but they're not regulated by that program. Right. Okay. So CDC helps mm -hmm. and it minimizes the risk for you know, damages basically to the to the Dallas levee system. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth is pretty high up in the basin, so ours are, mm -hmm. are not as likely to be impacted by anything in CDC. Mm -hmm. um, but we're kind of the 900-pound gorilla on the west end of the, mm -hmm. the Metroplex that we we participate. And so that's that's kind of the nuts and bolts of that. Anything else to add on to that, Ben? No. So so that is all storage in the Trinity River. Not just going to add. One of the Army Corps guys told us that <clears throat> the amount of storage that the Trinity River holds, and not just between Fort Worth and Dallas, I think down mm -hmm. to, to the coast, is uh, way more than all of the, res you know, the Army Corps reservoirs can hold combined. So it is a the concept of valley storage is a huge, right. okay. huge amount of water, and it, it adds up. So it's like a natural detention pond that slowly attenuates these flood waters and allows them to okay. maybe work their way down stream. So and again we're you know with the there's different size cities that were on the survey list that we, we put together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Frisco and Plano and those kind of folks, you know, they they may or may not view value storage just the same as the others. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not in the C D C then they may not have anything that they deal with on Valley Storage. But some of them have Valley Storage requirements where there's like no loss and that's just how they deal with all their streams. Mm -hmm. And so it, I wish I could say there was a real pattern, and I, I just didn't see a real pattern in there. Okay. Got um, but there's some, you know, the, the blue semicircle there are the ones that are uh, participating in CDC, and then, you know, there's some of the ones that have no requirements are still in that zone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just kind of a crapshoot. Okay. Um, and then, kind of refreshing on, on what we did as a as a study area, we looked at this uh, White Branch tributary. Um, we hired the firm EPR to go look at this for us, and they basically looked at you know what happened in in that basin, kind of from the beginning of, of time in, in the city of Fort Worth. It was largely undeveloped in the in the 70s, um, and then I was involved when I was on the consulting side in developing some of those streams. As that built out into the you know the mid 90s and early 2000s, um, so we have a lot of information on that particular basin, and uh, so we we use that as our our sample. Um, they compared you know what what the basin used to look like back when it was pasture land to you know, kind of almost essentially the fully developed condition that's out there now, and looked at you know how the encroachment of those floodplains make those floodplains more narrow to allow for development. Uh, affected runoff and uh, kind of our our findings were that there were decreases in valley storage um, that have resulted in increases in peak flows which we kind of expected um, particularly with the more frequent storms which that was kind of the unknown aspect for us is these the storms you get every two or five years they're they're showing a bigger increase in runoff than the larger storms were and then part of that is because the existing detention basins that were constructed out there are doing a pretty good job for detaining the storms that they were designed to work with. So like the 100-year storm is typically the one that they're working with. Um, those are functioning pretty well. So the 100-year storm, the real you know, infrequent damaging storm, is not seeing as big an increase in additional runoff as those more frequent storms. Um, Talking those historic ponds that were done 20 years ago, but right. the ones we're doing now, aren't they designed right. differently? Yeah, they didn't have regulations to detain for the one in five. Like right, right. 
And that's, that's, a, that's a, a way that the Fort Worth uh, drainage criteria has evolved over time is, you know, the old storms, the old ponds were designed for the 100-year kind of period because that's what everybody looked at. That was kind of the FEMA model. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the, the one-year and the five-year storms that are included in all current and new ponds that are going in. So a lot of the current developments that, that Travis and Lewis are involved in, they're having kind of a more sophisticated pond design mm -hmm. that deals with these kind of more frequent storms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of the way that, that the city's been trying to really move and adapt to this newer kind of way of managing runoff and, and not having impacts off-site, mm -hmm. is to look at these more frequent storms. Okay. And that's, go ahead. I have a curious question maybe on the last slide. Uh, okay. Is, is, and if it's not relevant, I don't, just don't get too far off track. When you look at the historic the green on the left and then the, the change in the percent imperviousness on the right, is the, the impact from that, does it affect, what area does it affect? Does it affect that same area and that boundary or is it downstream further? So how far away or removed is the impact zone when you lose um, you know, impervious ground cover? And is there an effective measurement for that? I'm not really asking what the number is right now. Is there a way to, like, I think it's very interesting to be able to put a percent like, on a map, the green and the red, right? Mm. And does it translate some, somewhere to millions of cubic feet of water and where? It, it could. And, and in this particular basin, um, what we looked at is, you know, it's draining from the north down to the south, and then it, it's, it's basically one stream system that drains into Big Fossil Creek. Mm -hmm. And so it dumps into Big Fossil Creek kind of right near 377 and almost Beach Street or somewhere in there, just, just east of Beach Street. So at the outfall, you can calculate how much additional water is coming to that point. Mm -hmm. And then what does that do downstream? We didn't, we didn't chase it downstream, but logically it's going to have some something going on downstream. Mm -hmm. Is it bad or not? We didn't we didn't investigate that. Mm -hmm. uh, but oh, some impacts too in different areas like roadway crossing. But, but 15, you'd, 20 years ago. You'd expect to have people like at the end of the day, people complaining their neighborhood's flooding, right? It, even in this area. Well and it probably isn't flooding unless you know some areas are flooding well, because you know, we had we had the two foot <clears throat> rule, and, but maybe the watershed elevation is higher than it used to be right. through there. Right. 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 And there, there could be a situation where you know there's you know it's one of those roads like Tarrant Parkway mm -hmm. or Heritage Trace or something like that. It went in there you know 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Some of those road crossings could have been built to a different standard. Mm -hmm. And then if they you know if, if they weren't built to this the same standard, it could be a situation where you you saw that road over top. Mm -hmm. or something like that, mm -hmm. because what we considered ultimate or what our design standard was changed. Um, and then Texas design standards are like much smaller storms, mm -hmm. so they could flood more frequently. Mm -hmm. so those, those kind of things could happen, and that's kind of what we want to understand is, you know, when, when we encroach into these streams, what is the effect of that encroachment? How much more water is it putting downstream faster? Right. It, it boils down to being kind of a timing change. Mm -hmm. Because okay. um, the faster the water goes, that, it, that changes how much water appears to come off of your basin mm -hmm. in a you know, given storm. Okay. So I, I think like Larissa was saying, <clears throat> by not accounting for it, it, it can kind of undermine what our buffer is to begin with. Mm -hmm. Because we've set this two-foot buffer, but then we're allowing this loss in valley storage. And over you know many years, and what they did quantify at different design points, at different uh, what you call junctions, where some streams meet together throughout. They did quantify that increase in, in the amount of water mm -hmm. coming through and, and the water surface elevation. So uh, that is that is something they documented in that report. But yeah, I think I think it it does vary. It could be certain points more than others, mm -hmm. but I think generally it just pushes the problem further downstream. Okay. Let's see, Don, you got your hand raised up there. Yeah, a couple of questions. So, um, I guess if you go to your next slide, you kind of had some conclusions or whatever, but um, 
most of that white branch area probably, or at least half of it, I'm going to guess, was designed under your old standards. And that's about probably right. I, I guess what I would be looking for is, 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 you know, so to me, it's like you're not, if, if there's a thought to add additional regulations and requirements to our drainage standards, we should be comparing it against what our drainage standards are today, shouldn't we? I mean, that's, you know, we, we, you know, we talked about the fact that now we design ponds for the one, is it one, two, and five or one and five? Um, you know, we're, we're designing ponds different and doing our drainage different and, and shouldn't we analyze what we're, what the driving force may be towards adding any kind of valley storage requirements against today's standards instead of looking at a drainage basin that right. could design most of the facilities in it to today's standards, it would be designed differently anyway. Right. And we can't go back in time to you know, undo that stuff. I think you know, what exactly. we can do is try, we can understand kind of what, what the impacts are to the systems that are already in place. And so if, if right. we end up with undersized culverts, we need to know that. Um, but I think we want to be mindful of the, the regulations and requirements we have in place now and see if, you know, where does it make sense to, to modify those to, to try to deal with the situation a little more efficiently. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. yeah and I guess ultimately what I, I guess my question, Claire, is what, what is the driving force for this? I mean, is this something COG is pushing? Is is this just local staff deciding we need to take a look at it? It's is you know where's the what's the impetus for this? Well, I think the the question really came process. from from us uh, as as city staff, and then getting input from from residents. Uh, you know, when when we hear that there's a a flooding problem that's going on in an area that you know meets our criteria, or you know the whole area was developed and met, met our criteria at the time, uh, but we're still seeing uh, impacts in some way. How do we deal with that? So that's that's kind of mm -hmm. what the initial driver was. We you know we've got the two forks of this this project. You know one is impervious cover, which we'll get into later, and then we've got this valley storage or flood storage thing, which um, kind of seemed like a little easier one to kind of get into the process with, um, you know, nobody, FEMA doesn't regulate valley storage. We haven't ever really regulated valley storage in the city except for the corridor development certificate. And what we what we want to do is, is understand, you know, where have we, where have we got problems that are related to us not dealing with valley storage? And then what do we do to, prevent that from happening in the future. So I think you know, the purpose of our study that we did was find out if there's an impact. Well, we found an impact. And now we're at the point of what do we do about that? And so I think you're, you're spot on with you know, how we need to look at dealing with it. We don't want to look back in time. We can't undo any of that stuff. It's all out there. It's mm -hmm. all concrete in the ground now. Um, but looking forward, how do we try to keep it from being worse on our own infrastructure and affecting developments that are already out there in the fields and you know, people living in houses and developments, you know, businesses next to channels and stuff like that. How do we keep that from getting worse? That's kind of the, the overarching aspect of a whole lot of stormwater is let's not make anything worse. So Yeah. I understand. It just seems like it's 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 kind of a it's it's a solution, but I mean, there's not like a, a target like other than that we're having flooding problems, but we can't really, you know, different parts of the city that have flooding problems may not all even be the same reasons. And and so I, I just, I mean, yeah, could you do things, to, you know, you could always enact regulations that are more stringent that could make, you know, drainage better, but it'll, you know, at some point you have negative economic impacts and, uh, but there's always a, you know, there's always a way to balance all of that, but I, I just, are we, are we, will this fix all the flooding problems across the city if we do this? No, I don't think anybody expects us to solve all the flooding problems. I think the big thing we want to do is um, 
when we're when we're going in to solve a new problem, let's make sure our standards are reasonable for whatever the new design is going to be. So we don't want to design something that that as soon as it's constructed is undersized because we haven't accounted for all the impervious cover or all the valley storage changes that could be allowed under our current regulations. So we're trying to kind of get ahead of it and make sure that the stuff right. that we do build uh, is going to last longer ultimately. Okay. We're not trying to repeat issues in the past, right? What's that? We're not going to repeat issues, known issues in the past. We're trying to get a handle on it. Right. Let's not let's not re repeat the, the sins of the past. Exactly. Well, I, I yeah. understand, but I guess what I'm saying is I don't see a study that says that the valley storage is the sin of the past that's causing significant problems. You know, or you know, if you're talking about this, so. I, I'm, and again, I'm not, I'm not opposed to, to, to this necessarily, or, to your, or depends on where we land, but I'm just trying to figure out, what, is, is, is this a targeted solution to a problem? Do we, you know, I mean, or is it a, you know, you know, we can do this and, and it'll be better, but we can't quantify how better or what parts will be better and what parts it will not improve. Yeah, I think that the target is not necessarily a location. It's more of a more of a criteria or a kind of a global application. It's it's going to be a situation where, you know, like in White Springs, there's you know 99 percent of that's built out. Um, so we, you know, changing something there is not going to really, you know, affect that basin because it's all built, and we've got a number right. of those across. The city. Um, but when we come in with something new, we want to make sure that it's done in a way that doesn't exacerbate the problem downstream. And that's that's really kind of the look that we're trying to put on it is let's let's be mindful of the stuff that's you know, been constructed downstream for the last 150, 175 years, and not make that worse, and then also make sure that whatever we do put in is going to have that lifespan that it's not going to be you know blown out you know 20 years from now when we would expect it to be you know 50, 75, 100 year lifespan on some of that stuff. Does there need to be a case study for this? It's just a question to get people to understand kind of if this is a true impact and kind of put your hands around like how much is that what you're asking? Like do we need numbers to kind of say how much the valley storage impact? That's probably a good next step for what we did on the study. Because the study didn't really chase down specific impact, but we could probably find stuff within that basin. Yeah. Yeah. So a case study that's a good so I think the case study answered the question, is valley storage important to mitigate, to, to offset impacts downstream, peak flow impacts? So, so I think, Don, the, the larger target is our stormwater mission, which is protecting people and property from harmful stormwater runoff. So, so that's like the broad goal is to protect people and property. and then. Looking at valley storage, it's something we've identified as an additional tool that we're not utilizing now to help uh, do that or achieve that mission, I guess. So um, we're already doing a lot of things, and, and this is one. And it's, I think also the, the benchmarking not only helps us look at what other communities are doing, but, but the fact that other communities are doing it, um, it's, it's a kind of a best practice that we've identified that, you know, we, we ought to be implementing um, as one of those tools to, to protect people from flooding. Do you want to talk about the recommendation? Is that your goal? Sure. So, um, I guess we're a little over an hour in now. Um, ben fixed and take off. He's got a presentation to some real estate folks on floodplain stuff. <laughs> He's become popular in that world these days. <laughs> um, so the recommendations are, are kind of a, a short list of stuff that I've, I've put together from taking notes in, in the last you know, meetings and other times that we've gotten together. Um, there's always the option of doing nothing. Um, I feel like we, we probably can't really support doing nothing at this point. Um, we've got you know enough of a study result to show that there is potential for impacts, but what we, we don't want to do is just kind of something willy-nilly. We want to put some thought into what we want to do. And so 
the ways that other folks have handled this, uh, either in other cities in, in our study or, you know, things that we've talked about in the past, are uh, adopting something like the CDC style requirements for all streams rather than just the Trinity. Um, the upside of that is that it's, it's a consistent methodology that everybody understands right now. It would just get kind of applied elsewhere in the city. Um, we wouldn't be looking at going through the same uh, review hoops that the, the CDC has, because right now if you do a CDC, you submit it to the city, we send it out to the Corps of Engineers, the Corps of Engineers reviews it, there's a substantial review fee on there. Um, we would handle all that internally, like we do a normal flood study. Um, and there's there's fees for that, but we like to keep all that as consistent as possible. Um, there's also, you know, the option of, you know, do we allow some valley storage laws? Do we just specify that we're going to try to mitigate as much as we can, but we're going to allow up to a 15% loss? And that seemed to be a real common number amongst those other communities that we surveyed. Um, Obviously, that's an impact, but it's a, a smaller impact and it's a manageable and predictable impact. So, if, if right now, if you've got one development that loses 30% and one that you know loses 2%, you don't really know how that's going to work out until you really get in and start you know, doing the calculations on that. But if we if we know that 15% is allowable, we can kind of predict what that might turn out to be in kind of the, the fully developed final situation. How do you mitigate a fully developed situation when you're allowing all developments to have 15% lost? At some point in time, it's going to catch up to you. Like it, That's my concern with that is you're saying that we really need to do something. We know there's a problem, but then we're saying, okay, a little bit of flag is okay. Right. And so I feel like you're not being consistent. And, and yeah. is, is it possible to know or to guess even historically what the percentage value loss has been in our in our area? I mean, is it yeah, on, Is it 50% or is it 10% or 2%? Yeah. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I suspect we have that with the, the case study that we did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll dig that up and see what that number looks Cause, like. Because if, if, if there's a discussion, to your point, about what's the impact of 15%, mm -hmm. well, if it's been 30 or 40% for the last 50 years, then and nobody's flooding it nobody. at this yeah. is, is an improvement. Right. Right? And right. That's better. But... Um, but if it hasn't been that much and we still have a problem, then that's crazy. Yeah. Right. Right. And so that's, that's a good point. Um, and I think, you know, we've got our, our higher standards mm -hmm. to try to account for some of that, but it's not, it's not a direct accounting. It's a, we're going to place this up two feet and then hope that right. whatever the impact <laughs> is doesn't exceed that. Right. Um, and so I'm not aware of a situation where something has been you know, developed and then flooded later, even though it met all current criteria. But there's mm -hmm. the situations where older areas that may not have had the same criteria have, have seen impacts. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I agree that the 15% the is kind of odd in that, that type of scenario. Um, similarly, you could say that, you know, you could require, just like that other city does, Winneka, you know, require more than one to one mitigation. So you try to Mm -hmm. Push it the other direction. Right. Um, that tends to offload the mitigation onto the new developments to make up for the sins of the old developments. Mm -hmm. And so that's that equitable or fair. I don't know. Um, end of the day, you're still trying to achieve the same goal, but uh, that just means that the new folks have to make up for what was happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's all over town. I mean, like, we really do have 150, 175 years of development in the city that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it didn't have any criteria. And so how do you manage that? That's, those are all kind of things that I think to think of. And then if there's other options that we've run across or thought about, um, I think this would be a, a good op opportunity to kind of put those out on the table and we can discuss amongst ourselves even while we're sitting here. Ideally, I'd like to have something that we could point to is here's what we think looks best. And then, you know, over the next week or two, you know, me and Ben and Lisa and Juliana can get together and, and mm -hmm. polish up what that looks like, send it back out to y'all and see if that's what we want to do to, to really call our recommendations that we would send forward. So, yeah, there's some combination of those things. Just mm -hmm. texting Tim Whitefield, who's listening in. He was like, it's Lina and Briscoe do kind of a combination of different things. They kind of label their streams as major and minor. And right. Now, 
you know, some loss for the minor ones, but no loss for major. Maybe I get that backwards, but there's a there's things you can do in different communities. Right. Yeah. Um, ben had mentioned that too. What, what Travis is getting at is, you know, White Branch. Let me flash back there. White Branch is a tributary of of Big Fossil, so Big Fossil at the bottom, and you go up and you kind of got the main stem of, of White's Branch. Mm -hmm. Then you got these little fingers that run up there. So there's, White's Branch might be a main creek, and then there are minor creeks. Mm -hmm. and there's there's different allowances for the main creek versus the minor creeks. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the, the minor creeks are going to have less impact, because they're smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's... But I like your point, though, without knowing where you're at, I mean, how do you know if 15% or I mean, decrease I could, or 10% increase is going to do anything? I, I, I could imagine, like, the stakeholders who later get to, well, the, the voter, you know, the, uh, the, say the council, or how, <laughs> however this gets approved, mm -hmm. folks who know less about this, the subject matter expertise, will look and say, what's broken, what problem are we solving, and how do you know it's going to fix it? Mm -hmm. And and that, that sort of begs, like, have, think through those questions and how we would answer how do you know? And, in, and it's, a, it's a hard topic and it's vague. So it's, it's comp I know it, I can understand it, it's complex to try to answer it in a meaningful way. But that's also going to get to a political situation. Yeah. Right? And so something's going to happen. Someone's going to flood. Someone's going to get hurt. And they're going to say, well, you just approved this thing. I allowed 15% less. And that's going to cause issues, right? Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, that's pretty powerful as well. Like the, the options, like 15%, allow 15 or go to 1.1, 1 .1 or mm -hmm. there's a range. And you gotta, have to, I guess you gotta dial in what makes sense for this area, this geography, right? Right. Um, and and is there the belief that it will have some general trend impact, like like he was saying, like make just make it better? Mm -hmm. You you talked about development, like the past development, and it's kind of too late because it's there. Where would any change, any recommendation that came out of this effort with a change? Where would those policies be applied? The, those changes, I'm going to call them policies, best practices. Where would they be applied? Like in this area, in other basins, um, in Fort Worth, in the city of Fort Worth. Um, in, in other words, in in the conversation of this development, so maybe that's too late to make a change. Where we apply the changes would. Do they have the chance to be effective? Right. So in in White Branch, there's not many opportunities left. Mm -hmm. um, that's you know we kind of chose this basin because it's essentially built out. Um, where we could benefit is you know, on a capital project. If we had to go back and reconstruct a culvert on some road crossing, mm -hmm. we would know mm -hmm. that it's not just the flows that result from this aspect of our criteria, but we have this other mm -hmm. thing to consider that has also influenced the drainage. So we'd be able to look at it more informed. Mm -hmm. um, as you go outside of this basin where there's you know kind of greenfield situations, mm -hmm. um, that's where the the real benefits would come in working in those kind of greenfields. So you'd be able to stay ahead of mm -hmm. um, what you knew that the, the likely runoff conditions and the ultimate flooding would be mm -hmm. more so than our, our criteria now allows. And so you'd, you'd be able to uh, better predict what those ultimate flows would be, and then size your culverts to, to take them. Whereas, you know, right now, when, when White Branch was built out, they didn't look at the changes in valley storage throughout mm -hmm. the whole basin. They just mm -hmm. here's the basin size, here's the culvert size that comes from you know trying to manage that. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of missed the boat on probably all of them. Mm -hmm. Did they miss it by this much or this much? Mm -hmm. We don't really know, but we can dig into that and see if there's a, a way to find out. So okay. um, that's what we're trying to do is get ahead of those potential changes in the future where we, you know, if we don't deal with the valley storage, then we know we're going to have more water coming mm -hmm. uh, to those those different crossings and different types of infrastructure, and we can account for it better. Mm -hmm. well, Larissa, how often are you getting comments right now? From like, Fort Worth or yeah, anything? From Fort Worth on, on balancing and mitigation on your flood studies. Because Tim's telling me that we're already kind of de facto doing this on because the, the reviewers are already asking these questions around. When we know there's flooding downstream or a big problem, we have to look at it at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So, 
or secondary, I guess. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. more of the downstream impact analysis and that's when you decide, right? Because in the study, um, valley storage loss is not only that cut and fill balance that you talked about. It's also sometimes you can get valley storage by increasing the water surface elevation throughout a reach. And so we have to kind of look at both of that and, of course, the hydrologic timing of the watershed. So I agree with Tim. We're, we're looking at it in not a direct way as what you're trying to define it here. And so mm -hmm. we, are, we are already looking at it. We just need to decide how we want to put that in words, right? And I think my experience, because I have other communities that we look at and, um, you know, we, they will have a couple of sentences in their ordinance that says, you know, you need to look at valley storage. And that's all it says. And so then when we get to the reviewer, they're like, eh, you know, every reviewer defines it differently. <laughs> um, and so some of the challenges we come up with is that, you know, we have to we have to figure out what the best method is for defining that. So that's right. what I would like to talk through in the recommendations is how do we define that as a study criteria. Right. So um, the net benefit for you would be consistency in how you deal with it from one project to the next. Right. And, and it may not be that there is a consistency is what I found because sometimes maybe you do have a very small project and you do need to look at just that cross section. And you need to balance it in that one little bitty cross-section area, right? Mm -hmm. It needs to be that type of solution. And then sometimes you're, you're you're looking at a really big project. You own both sides of the creek. You know, you kind of like the, you know, you got to decide where that valley storage needs to go, right? It might not need to go at every cross-section. Mm -hmm. um, some cities have defined it as every cross-section. That's been a very big challenge when you own both sides of the creek. That's not the best solution hydrologically you know, looking at that peak discharge. Um, so, so we've had to convince the, the city or review team on that as well. So just, just saying that definition is, is pretty important with this recommendation. I think for me, it's just being consistent as number one, both <coughs> from doing the work and then also reviewing the work and make sure there's some just thought process so we all understand like how do you come up with the percentage if that's the way we go yeah. or the minor major creeks, you know, how do we come up with that? It's not just arbitrary. I know a few ways we can do that, but there's some criteria now that people ask, why is it done that way? Why is it that number? And sometimes it's, well, you got to pick it up right. That's not yeah. a good answer. So. You had to pick something, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be perfect. Well, so, so this is Tim. To my, like, to my comment about we're just kind of doing this now, the way, what's good about the way we're doing it now is that it's, it's clear, like, the objective is clear. Like, you can't flood other people, and, and if you Allow, if you if you had this fill without this without cut, you could flood it. You could you could damage other people, harm other people, and I think if you have some kind of rule that says, you know, thou shalt have extra valley storage or whatever, what if what if it doesn't make sense? Like, or you know, what if it's difficult to to do, but it it doesn't really harm anyone downstream because the areas downstream aren't won't be affected by it. Like that's that's what I'd like to avoid. I'd, I'd like to have clear objectives so that way if you know judgment needs to come into it, that there's a there's a basis for making a judgment call. Instead of just having to follow a rule because it's a rule. Hey, Claire, my uh, Claire, my thoughts on this, um, regardless of what we end up with, whether it's one to one or whatever, is that we should either go to the identifying major streams versus minor streams or or do something maybe even a little simpler and say if we're going to take this step and do it before we just kind of you know i guess my thought would be to limit it to say like you start with this when you have a maybe a thousand acre drainage basin or something like that you know um which is going to get, you know, most of the major streams and whatever else, but something at the very top of the basin, um, you're, it's, it's going to be sometimes a lot more problematic because you have very small stream. I mean, if you want to follow it all the way up, you've got a stream that might have um, no real impacts that you could enclose into a storm drain, but now you can't because it's valley storage, you know, and, and, but it's a tiny, a bit of valley storage, but, if the rule's the rule, that that's that would you know you'd have to 
compensate for that. And I don't, I, I think if, if you did something like that, you would, you'd still be accomplishing more or less what you want to do, but making the, the upper ends of the, of the watersheds uh, easier, you know, for not only to develop, but also for, for arrears and everything. So. That's a good point, Don. I think it used to be a lot more common to put, you know, streams into a storm drain system, particularly at the upper end of the fringe of the, the basin. That's still what happens in neighborhoods. I mean, you put in your streets and you're collecting all your water, and at some point they, you know, they're all under the street until they are, you know, right. fall into a channel or something like that. Um, right. That's that's a that's a good way to look at that. I think we need to make sure that we're considering that kind of thing because that's realistically it's outside of most of the areas where we're going to be looking at stuff like this. You know, like in the neighborhood streets and those kind of storm drain systems, but. Uh, uh, we're, we're looking. I understand, but but I'm mean, sorry, but but like going back to kind of referring to what Tim said. I mean, I've sat in meetings where we have argued over a hundredth of a rise or two hundredths of a rise in a in a stream, and the reviewer is just you know this absolutely won't work. You know, it's got to be zero point zero, not zero point zero one. And so, if you write a rule and you write it literally. You could go to the very top of the hill, you know, the very top edge of the drainage basin and say this little rivulet has, you know, you've got to calculate this valley storage all the way to the very top and it may have, you know, two square feet of cross section, but there's some water running there. So I, I think limiting it would, would be reasonable and practical but would and would still essentially achieve in in a larger sense what you're going to want to do because you're going to deal with it on the uh, once you have a, a significant stream you know then that's where you're protecting valley storage and that's where you can protect it right yeah i think there's there's some value in trying to look at is there a minimum project size that this would apply to uh, is there a point you know like single family residents don't worry about that um, but I can tell you that there have been single family residences in uh, the Trinity that did have to deal with CDC Valley storage. Mary Kelleher's house is one that had to do that because um, I, I helped her walk through the permit process on constructing her house in the, the Trinity floodplain and make sure that it was elevated and safe. So, um, God bless you. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, but, but again, I, I think more than project size, I think you should based on the stream like like i said i think the easiest way is say something like a thousand acres of drainage area and larger is where you would apply this because then it's easy to calculate and you get a large enough project you know the upper upper half might not apply but the lower half may at some point the stream becomes large enough that then you start protecting valley storage from from that point downstream um I, I just thinking about how you, how you implement this and then going through reviews and everything else. I just think that something straightforward like that would would, would go a long way. And um, yeah. but I like Tim's yeah. idea too that put it put in there what the intent is so that it as he said, if there's a reason to do something different that's not quite within the rules, but it's it it meets the intent and and it, everybody acknowledges it work, then staff doesn't have to go like I I like it, but I can't approve it because it doesn't. You know, meet the rules. Right. It meets yeah. the intent. You know, then well, what's wrong with it? Yeah, and that's that's kind of why we got the stakeholder group. You know, the way we got it, we got some of our review team here, and we've got you here to you know kind of keep an eye on what the the you know the builders out there are having to deal with. So we want to make sure that we're getting those good perspectives, and that's you know something like the you know what is the upper limit of where we want to look at this and what is the smallest size project that would have to deal with this. Um, we want to be real mindful of, of trying to dot those I's and cross those T's as we put this together. Because <clears throat> consistency is, we want to be consistent and still at the end of the day, you know, make sure things are getting you know, built in a way that's safe. Sure. And yeah, we always talk about consistency, predictability. These are things that on our side of the table is so hard and it's hard on reviewers because there's no set rules to govern everything by. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're writing rules for the, the lowest 1% of the, of, the, of, the, of the people submitting things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, consistency works for developers so they can be more predictable on how they you know, get their stuff put on the ground, and it works for the city reviewers so that we know what the current is. Yeah, as well. Could you get the phone numbers to that, there with yeah. the 1,000 acres? I mean, whatever we're throwing out here, we can. The stormwater is always the one thing that's gray. It's just there's a thousand ways to skin mm -hmm. that cat, right? Water in a pipe's different, sewer in a pipe's different, roads are straight. <laughs> <laughs> it's predictable, right? Storm water is always the one thing that there's <laughs> little variances there. So, um, so where are we? <laughs> um, other options. <laughs> yeah, so other options. <laughs> I'm trying to move that way. Before we give a recommendation, yeah. we need to look at the back. So, we need to look at uh, kind of what what the change turned out to be from a loss of value storage in the White Branch model. We'll, we can pull that out and then send that out um, to the team to take a look at. And so I think my, what my plan will be is to try to um, consolidate what we've done here today into kind of a memo and then put the information in there that we're looking for. And then from a you know, from a minimum sizing perspective, I think from a floodplain mapping side, we're looking at 64 acres now. Is that right? Tenth of a square mile is what that is. And so if FEMA will map it up to a certain point, and then we're asking uh, development as they come in to extend that further within their property or to the point that it's 64 acre drainage basin, which is still pretty good size. Mm -hmm. Um, you're getting a lot of water off of that. Maybe that's the logical place to start and then see kind of what, you know, if there's a way. As, as part of your projects, have you kind of quantified how much storage is available in those smaller reaches? I haven't been sitting here thinking about it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I can see the wheels yeah. turning. So it's, it's one of those things where we might we might already be doing some of that work. I don't want to generate new work because I think a lot of times we're already you know, calculating these things. We're just not providing them for review or, or using them externally uh, as part of a permit application or a, a plan set application. So it's it's one of those things that could be generated already, just not being utilized. Mm -hmm. And so if there's something that we can do to take advantage of things we're already doing, that, that would be ideal. Um, and then we can kind of see what you know, what that losses. Does the criteria change at all if we know there's flooding already there with that size and then you know sometimes on the criteria we say you can allow you know tenth rise but if there's flooding it's no rise. So would we might have another criteria where no matter what size your development is, if there's no flooding, there's size culvert, whatever the issue might be, you have to provide it. That'd be kind of like they do with the, the downstream analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So right. If, if you we already look at when a development comes in, you know where where do where where do the impacts from your development kind of peter out? Mm -hmm. And there's like a 10% rule that um, 10% yeah. yeah. yeah, wherever your wherever your development falls in the basin, if you're you know 10% of the drainage area or less, mm -hmm. then certain things apply and others apply if you're more than that. So it's we're already looking at kind of a variety of different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Have to, yeah. have to think on how to make those play together as much as possible. I don't, again, I don't want to don't want to reinvent the wheel or, or cause new work. Right. Let's take advantage of what we're already doing. Yeah. Um, Claire, <clears throat> Claire, I would I would urge some caution. I mean, to me, 64 acres for something that we're not doing at all right now. To pretty much say that every project now of any size uh, with a 64 acre or a tenth of an acre limit uh, th that would essentially every project that I know of that I've done in Fort Worth that would it would impact every one of them and I would still suggest that we do something much larger 
to implement this to see what the impacts are and see what the unintended consequences are before we kind of jump in with both feet in something that we all think is a good idea, but nobody's beating on us saying you have to do this now. There's no, you know, big push regionally to do this or anything like that. So I, I, I would just encourage some caution that let's not go too far until we figure out what all this means as far as impacts in buildability and costs and impacts in, you know, the what the engineers have to do and consultants and what you have to do as a reviewer. So that's right. still my thoughts on that is let's not just get too go too far too fast. Let, yeah, you know. I think it's a good you, you point. You can always expand it, but honestly, once you put it in, it'll never get you'll you'll never reduce it city regulations never get reduced unless austin does it yeah i think that's that's something we want to be mindful of and i think when you're when you're talking about a, a larger basin you know i think we're we're already trying to be real mindful of you know if, if we if we looked at something like a 15 percent loss well 15 percent in a 64 acre basin is going to be tiny compared to 15 percent in a much larger basin so it, it, makes yeah. it less flexible. So that's something we need to be thinking about. Is there any way to know in the chart that you have for the other city studies? Do they have minimum size project development sizes? Do we know that? Is some of that I mean not right now today, but is it in those studies? It's it's if it's documented in the notes within that spreadsheet, mm -hmm. then they called it out. I think they mentioned like in Frisco or somewhere where they've got, you know, the major stream, minor stream. Mm -hmm. I think they called that out. Mm -hmm. But I don't recall off the top of my head if they had a certain basin size that they looked at as a minimum. Mm -hmm. I'll have to go back and relook at that. It, it might just be a curious reference point if other cities have already tackled this. Right. What did they discover? I don't remember the size. I can't think of one that was on there. I can't think of with the minimum drainage size, drainage sizes, just that major minor. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I got your your point taken there, Don, and uh, we definitely don't want to nail something down that's going to be super onerous. Um, I think we. Oh, Lisa's got a comment that Cog is working on uh, the TSI project to look at some of this you outside of the Metroplex area. So, and that's, that's a good point yeah. that the, the Council of Governments is working on this, uh, what does TSI stand for? Transportation and Stormwater Infrastructure yeah. Initiative. Yeah, so there's there's a link between the transportation projects and stormwater projects that is being kind of focused through the Council of Governments to get you know, as much external funding as possible for projects. and. There's a huge component of any kind of transportation project that's related to drainage. Mm -hmm. And so as they try to deal with drainage tied to transportation, there's also the potential to look at things like detention or, or valley storage or uh, you know other ways to mitigate potential problems. Mm -hmm. And making those funds available through the kind of the transportation corridor works better than just asking for drainage money. Mm -hmm. That's just the way of the world. They so. actually hired the UTA uh, to look at optimizing the floodplain also and that part of that initiative and just to say that it's the outer skirts of what the, the CDC process looked at. So CDC only goes up to Lake Louisville and then kind of that, that outer skirt of the Mitchell Lake. This looks at everything outside of that that come, could come in the future, mm -hmm. which is where you're seeing your problems, right? Because just like you said, they're not regulated. So. Right. Anything that's being developed out there is why you're flooding downstream. It may be that we regulate the valley storage, but if these watersheds have something from those areas that don't have the regulation, you still could be impacted. Right. And I think that's a good point for us. You know, we, we picture ourselves as kind of the upper end of the basin, but we are not. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff, you know, out west and up north that, you know, drains through us, mm -hmm. through the tributaries that go down to the Trinity. We inherit all that water and we have no control over any of that. Mm -hmm. And so um, Tarrant Regional is very sensitive to how that basin is going to develop and impact the infrastructure they maintain that provides flood protection through downtown Fort Worth. So there's a lot of looking at that, but also acknowledging we've got no control over those those areas. So is that an option to figure out how to get control over 
all those. So are, sure. I mean, to what do you call it? Encourage practices. Yeah. That, I mean, I know it can cause conflict as well, but right. I mean, but, this it's a it's a place to start a conversation with. Yeah. And the and the reality is on the the west side of the Metroplex, you know, the mm -hmm. Fort Worth design manual was the manual for all these little cities around mm -hmm. us because they all just told us cheaper and easier for them to just adopt the Fort Worth <laughs> way than to come up with their own manual. So they all did it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I don't know if that's still the case. I think it is still. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. All of us are working in. I think if we if we had something in version. pocket, it would be easier for someone to pick and, that up and, and go with it. And, and maybe that's a consideration as well. Is when we talked about the six inches, mm -hmm. one foot, two foot. How much can you get? How much does it cost? What's the benefit? If there's a plan that's so crazy, extreme in Fort Worth, all the other communities say, oh, that's outrageous. We can never do that. Forget it. If there's a plan that's moderate and reasonable and provides reasonable benefit to Fort Worth, is there more likelihood that other communities would adopt it and then help the overall problem with the flow to Fort Worth? Right? Right. Like looking at the bigger picture and what are the chances that that could be successful? It right. might be, I, I don't know, I mean, I, maybe we're creating more work for ourselves, but. Well, no, I think that's where a lot of, like, re, is, the, is the Fort Worth plan reusable? Mm -hmm. to, the, and to the degree that other communities might be interested. A lot of cities still use kind of that high basic approach, which is based on, so there's a lot of similarities. I should just get some of them all. Let's see. There's a lot of commonalities with a lot of what we do in the high zone. Or more. I mean, especially if, you know, this idea that you get other people to pay for things, right? I mean, if there's a benefit to Fort Worth that Fort Worth doesn't necessarily have to pay for <laughs> because other cities enact practices, mm -hmm. then that's kind of a powerful thing. Right. I mean, yeah, I think that's a lot of the utility of the benchmarking that we, we yeah. did kind of yeah. for our spreadsheet yeah. is to see what else is going on around us and uh, see how much of that makes sense for us. To, to try to translate, and uh, it's, it was interesting that there were a number of cities that went with the 15 percent. It kind of makes me wonder if that's is that in the Dallas manual, and then maybe they pick that up, or or where did that come from? <clears throat> and then does that make sense for us? <laughs> so, but if we do that, then we can expect everything west of us is going to do the same thing, probably. <laughs> Are you going to send an email out for information? Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll try to consolidate this as much as we can. Um, do we have a feel now at this point for any of these potential options we've talked about, talked about that are just non-starters, something we don't want to mess with, or do we do we need to dig into them a little more on a case study basis and, and see what they look like? I'm seeing another meeting coming out. <laughs> Yeah, I think we, I mean, obviously the do nothing thing, I'm, I'm for getting rid of that option. Right. Yeah. But I include it because it's Which one do, you do nothing. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense not to address yeah. certain situations. Um, but I think it's, it could be a case by case thing. I'd like to look at getting more educated on the other deal. I'll talk to Tim, mm -hmm. and my guys, and see what other cities are doing and why they select doing. Major streams versus minor streams, or why they selected doing 15% mm -hmm. re reduction. I mean, what, how does that work and why? There's got to be some reasoning behind that. Is it because they have other more stringent code requirements on other things, whether it's detention or whatever else, that allows it to freeze them up? I don't know what that give and take is. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to look at some more give and take and see what that is and, and see before we can recommend rec 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 okay. on this. So that, what I'll do is I'll focus on. So I think the one to one mitigation for me, I mean, it's just a blanket requirement that isn't. Yeah, I don't want it to be that strict. You know, if we if you say that one, like that one's probably not the best way to go. Just say everybody has to do it. it right, it's not going to be. One. Yeah. It was the one I was worried about. Yep. One to one up seems a little more reasonable. So. Oh, one, one to one. One to one is oh, natural. Oh, I thought that was the same as no loss. This is, I thought that might have should have said one point one. <laughs> Did you mean yeah. that to be one to one or one point one? Yeah. yeah. Is that, is that a 10% rule? Is yeah. there a certain ballpoint? Like, so, so it's greater than one. one. 
Yeah. Yeah. So require greater than one to one. So that would be like the one point one or one point five or two to one or whatever. Um, to me, the the one to one is kind of the natural. You, you put in a thousand, you take out a thousand. It, it maintains what's there. That's, that's how right? I <laughs> clean up after yourself when you come here and just leave it exactly the same as where how you found it. Right. Yeah, so exactly. that's some right. like logic yeah. to saying that. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the CDC style. Does Arlington do one point one? No, no loss. Yeah, so I think I think Arlington has more than one point one. Oh, really? No more than one point one two one. Sorry. Yeah, I, I do remember. think it's unreasonable to have each cross section um, totally yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That'd ideally, it'd be a reach. Choose a reach. Or on your side. <laughs> yeah, on your side. Okay. Yeah, I hate to waste more people's time on another meeting or not, but or maybe just provide feedback yeah, from I, this conversation and then we could all get get with you and tell you our, our recommendations. Yeah, ideally I'd like to be able to throw this out as kind of a memo thing and then get some feedback, condense that down into a, a bullet point or two about what the recommendation is and get some buy in concurrence by email rather than another meeting. Um, but we can, you know, do another WebEx or whatever. Because I, I feel like the, this is still the low hanging fruit, the easy one. <laughs> so, um, you think Perkins cover is going to be more of an issue? That's great. Oh, yeah. I was about to end that. And, yeah, you know, you can't just say the, the value storage. It probably has to follow with something about, you know, what are you changing the end value of this area as if it's floodplain? You know, what you have to look at more things than just valley storage when you're looking at it, right? Because once you start doing that, you just have to. You mitigate for that that in value change if you do sets and treat areas if you do yeah because I, I think it's it's that's a good point in values are not just a volume mm -hmm. um, you'll you'll end up if you change the in values the which is the roughness coefficient of your channel um, mm -hmm. the channel if it's a lower in value it's more efficient the water goes through faster mm -hmm. water surface drops mm -hmm. you lose value storage. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that also increases flows. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a balancing act like the rest of us can that. And uh, so there's a car. What's that? You may have good brakes, but you don't have a steering wheel. It doesn't really help you a whole lot. Right. <laughs> and so th I think for us, you know, the, the focus has mostly been on the volume, um, but you can obviously have impact on valley storage without fill. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that's that's a big deal on the quarter development certificate mm -hmm. because make those channels more efficient and that the water surface actually drops. Mm -hmm. And that in, in any other development that looks good on the Trinity, that's bad mm -hmm. because the, the impacts go so far that the volume is massive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, there's there's all kinds of, it is a balancing act there. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in White's branch, you know, we just, we didn't look at the volume that was filled basically or channelized. And so that was kind of the look at that and understand what that system looked like. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll put some numbers together based on that mm -hmm. specific study and say this is what happened in this basin, mm -hmm. you know, X number of you know acre feet or cubic yards or whatever value storage was gained or lost. Mm -hmm. And then the impact of this was flows at this much at the outlaw or something like that or at specific locations. I don't want to get too down in the weeds, but enough to say that this is, you know, this is how it impacted the basin. And so that would be our target for not having those impacts elsewhere as we try to roll this out. Um, That'd be helpful. I'd be very helpful. I think okay. it's been a good discussion. Just and then uh, if we, you know, we focus on not greater than one to one, mm -hmm. just the, the common sense, you know, dollar in, dollar out kind of thing. Uh, that would be the starting point. Is that kind of what we're getting at? And then um, all the way down to the loss. What's that? The one extreme to the other, I guess, right? Would be no loss of valley storage. Mm -hmm. Is that the kind of the lowest? Which would be the one to one, no greater? Yeah, to me, the one to one and no loss is the same. Right. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, as long as we're not you know, over mitigating yep. um, and we're not allowing a 15% loss or something like that, just if it's a straight one to one, that makes the most sense. Everybody gets it. And we're kind of already doing that, I think, most places. Um, 
if there's other ideas that kind of come out of the, the woodwork, we can yeah. consider those. But I think that's, that's a pretty solid place to start from. So, cool. I think we did well, and we're five minutes ahead of the end of the, or ten minutes ahead. Um, is there anything else we need to discuss today? Um, on the, I guess next step, I'll finalize the recommendations to send those out in kind of memo format. Um, we will start the impervious cover discussions next time. Does any of this have any impact on our mass conversation this afternoon? What are we talking about this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> the manuals. The manuals, the design manuals. The design manuals. So this will not go in the design That we're trying to force through the system right now? Uh, this will not. No. This, not, uh, the, this is not. Okay. Next round. Yeah. Next round. Next round, yes. Storm water. Yeah. I feel like being Marissa. I <laughs> think my office is much better. Um, so this is what it feels like. We're we're still polishing our cumulative impacts webpage that we're restoring recordings of this meeting and then the meeting notes and those kind of things on that webpage and we'll hopefully be in a position where we can update it with when the next meeting is that kind of stuff. Um, that's just about ready to go. And if there's no other topics, then I think we're at the end. Anything else to cover? When you send out the information, can you set a goal date for when you want comments back? And I like to be sooner than later. I mean, five to ten days here. And yeah. Let's get this thing going. Yep, that works. The longer we wait, the, the, more, I, the more I forget between these. You said Valley Storage, but what was the second um, item for this meeting? That, just want to make sure I understood. Impervious. Imp Imp impervious cover and changes that are allowable under our current regulations. Okay. And so when we say, you know, if we anticipate 65% impervious cover on a residential lot for A5 or whatever it is, we currently allow 85% because we don't regulate anything in the backyard. So the reality is, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Whatever else. The reality is more water runs off than we anticipate. And so we want to get ahead of that too. And that, that's a criteria change or, you know, some other adjust our reality to what's actually going on. But I think that's 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 but to me I think where average people who want to put in a pool are gonna to have to deal with something like that. Or you know the, the projects like Don works on all the time where you know he's the home builder building you know four hundred homes. All of his stuff's gonna meet criteria until somebody comes in and changes something. And then we have to deal with something like that out there too. So that's that's the next step, not this one right now, but that'll be the second part of this this meeting series. Okay. I think that one's going to be interesting. Yeah, it will be. Okay. So. Perfect. So different parts of town looked at um, different. I mean, it can't be a one size fits all. Set. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to look at things differently in different locations because, Wait, like I you're saying, one size does not fit all. And like out in Randall Mill area is not going to be the same as you know up in, uh, in more lying areas, areas that have such more of a flood prone well, area. We're all hilly, so I mean anything that's done above us to versus the prairie lands of northwest and Fort right. Worth. And we had, you know we had had uh, a big chunk of the cross timbers mm -hmm. that went through where we were last and had mm -hmm. because they removed it. Correct. Right. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to be part of the discussion, and then trying to fit and the requirements one in different areas. Scrappy tree in the front yard of 350 houses does not take the place of 2,000 over 2,000 to 300 over 300. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's why I think this next discussion is going to. Are you on that committee too? That from the forestry committee? No. Okay. You talked to Gina Bivens about that. There's a oh, yeah, Jim is our city. Yeah. 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 I sat in on there. Okay. Okay, well, I'm going to call this meeting over. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Claire. Thank you have two phones and two earbuds and two everything.